and gentlemen, I'm uh, Len Rydell. I'd like to welcome you to our uh, 12th or 13th uh, Zoom chat of uh, 2022. Uh, this evening, um, we have the, the tag team of uh, Scott Hartwig and Tom Clemens, uh, who are going to be doing a program uh, for us in September on um, uh, the Battle of Antietam. And uh, it's really one of those uh, uh, nexuses of, of perfect opportunity in which um, we've got two, the two people who are uh, arguably the two most knowledgeable people in the country on the uh, Maryland campaign. And certainly the, uh, uh, the, the, the leading experts. Uh, Tom is the, uh, and has been the longtime head of um, Save Historic Antietam Foundation has been wired into everything that has gone on in the battlefield. Was was close linked to um, uh, to Joe Harsh and and other folks, and um, uh, and then uh, uh, delved or dove deeply into the uh, Ezra Carmen papers. And then um, uh, Scott Hartwig, who was uh, making all sorts of um, uh, tracks all over the Gettysburg battlefield, was harboring his his secret ambition, which was a uh, a love and appreciation of the Maryland campaign. And so while he may have been the historian at Gettysburg, uh, his, his uh, research and heart and soul were in uh, analyzing this campaign. And so bringing the two of them together is uh, uh, just kind of one of those uh, Nirvana moments. And, and I think we're, we're delighted to have them on board. Now, what we're gonna do tonight is we're gonna, uh, we're gonna chat uh, about the battle a little bit, and uh, then uh, we're going to talk about the uh, the analysis of the battle and and um, uh, the, the primary documents that uh, that Tom worked with for some period of time with uh, Ezra Carmen that resulted in three outstanding and indispensable volumes uh, of uh, documentation uh, of which, if I'm a betting man, those three volumes are uh, somewhere in the background of. Uh, of Scott's uh, uh, work, and uh, then we'll also work with uh, with uh, one of the best qualified historians to sit back and and analyze a, a major military campaign and uh, see how those come together and how that um, uh, affected him and what he was doing and how he thought about things as he progressed through the campaign, which I guess. Um, you have been studying for the better part of 20 or so years, haven't you, Scott? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> More than that, you At put least. out that uh, bibliography yeah. in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, so I mean, so you you folks are in for a treat, and we, we will run out of time. Now, uh, what we're going to do is you, you have already noticed and some of you have discovered, um, uh, this is a round-robin discussion between um, uh, Tom, Scott, and myself, and uh, there, you all will realize that, um, that there's a chat button that's available up, uh, for people who are in on zoom and so forth. Uh, what you need to understand and what I ask you to avoid, uh, doing is, is, uh, chatting among yourselves during the course of their discussion, because all three of us will see any comments you make. And if they're not directed towards us, then you're distracting us from what we're doing, and uh, that's not fair to the other people because we'll invariably read what you're saying and so forth. What we want to use the chat room for, or the chat line for, is for you if you have any questions that come up during the course of what we're talking about, uh, go ahead and type them in there since you're all on mute, and um, uh, I'll look at them and determine when and how to to fold them into the discussion we have. I might fold them in at the time or I may hold them back till we get to the Q&A period. What you can also expect is right about, um, uh, about a quarter of nine, uh, Karen will put up a note to you all to unmute yourselves. That doesn't mean everybody start chattering and so forth. What it's just gonna do is it's gonna assist us in the Q&A period and if, we have questions. I'm going to try to open it up to the group for those questions starting about quarter or nine. And so the best bet for you will be to raise your hand using the, the system over there. 
and then I will uh, call on people when we're ready, and then you can just ask your questions directly. What I do ask you to do, because of the number of people on here and the need to allow everybody a fair opportunity, is if you got a question, ask a question, ask it quickly. Don't make a speech, please. Uh, if there is something that needs further discussion, we'll open it for further discussion. But um, uh, as you can tell from my five minutes of filibustering already, uh, if you think you got something important to say and you start doing it, you're going to eat up a lot of uh, Q&A time. So make your questions succinct and give the uh, historians an opportunity to answer those and, and we'll all get along fine. Right about nine o'clock, we're going to write wrap things uh, up. Uh, what we have done in the past is, um, because I know there's some of you on here who know Scott and Tom and maybe just want to say hi or something real quick. Uh, if they're able, um, we usually leave the line open for about five minutes after we're done. And um, uh, we give you a chance to say hi and so forth and maybe ask a question offline. And then we try and we plan to be off here between uh, five after nine and 10 after nine at the latest, uh, no later than 10 after nine. So, so those are the rules of the game. Um, um, again, Karen, uh, because we started a little late, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do the pitch. Um, uh, for those of you who may have to check off or whatever, do be advised that um, uh, Blue and Gray has a free YouTube channel and uh, uh, we will post this interview up on that YouTube channel. Um, pretty uh, within three or four days after uh, uh, Karen gets done processing it, we'll post it up uh, towards the weekend and um, you'll be able to look at it again. Uh, the registration forms for this program will will go up there. You see it's uh, uh, there. Uh, the registration uh, will go up uh, the latter part of this weekend. I promised myself we'll get that done and uh, you all will be able to register from that uh, from that point. Uh, the other thing um, uh, you may want to uh, to look at, I think Karen is uh, gone. Um, I'm not sure. I see you're typing something in, and I'm not sure what we're doing for that. Okay, I'm I'm not following all this yet, but okay, whichever I'm. I'm ready to I'm ready to open this up, Karen. So whenever you're ready to cut it off, I'm ready to cut it off. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, guys, uh, good evening. I'm, I'm delighted to have you all with us again. It's it's always good to uh, to spend some time with you, and uh, uh, we've got a nice group of folks who have come along to uh, to join us. And so, uh, welcome on board. Good to be here. Glad to be here. Good. Um, when uh, looking at uh, the Battle of Antietam, uh, the Confederacy, I, I, I think we, we saw in the Maryland campaign, we saw the, the first real opportunity that the Confederacy had to really take the war to the, to the enemy and, and to perhaps um, uh, exploit opportunities. Um, um, what, what was your view of, of the most uh, important reason for Lee to come north? Uh, what, what did you all, uh, why do you think Lee came north? Scott, go ahead and, and start with oh, okay. that if you would. Um, it was, uh, the most important reason was political um, because Lee, um, I think one of the best books that anyone can possibly read about thinking about Lee's strategy is Joe Harsh's Confederate Tide Rising. I think Joe Harsh got at the heart of um, Lee's strategic thinking better than anybody. And um, he, he really makes a solid point that Lee had very little confidence in European recognition of the Confederacy. And um, he thought the Confederacy was gonna have to look to their own you know, resources to win their independence. And, um, Lee, I think, recognized that fighting a defensive war in Virginia was a losing proposition. He had to carry the war into the North. He had to put the pressure upon the Lincoln administration. He had to put the pressure upon the Northern voter. And, you know, both his Gettysburg and his Maryland campaigns are both designed to do precisely that. He's far better resourced 
and supplied when he goes in in the Gettysburg campaign than he is in the Maryland campaign, which has a huge impact upon the outcome of his campaign. But I think Lee's uh, strategic thinking was very sound because when you get into the details of what goes on in Washington, D.C. after the Battle of Second Manassas, I mean, it's chaotic. You know, the Lincoln's cabinet is disagreeing with each other. There's a you know, big issue about who's going to command the army. Um, and I, so I think Lee's, um, Lee's strategic sense was, was sound. He, he understood the political situation. I think Lee, uh, throughout the war, understood the politics of the war better than Jefferson Davis did, um, because he was also always advocating concentration of force. Give up some territory, concentrate your force. That's going to enable you to win what uh, uh, Joe Harsh describes Lee saying as heavy victories, meaning victories in which you inflict a lot of damage on the enemy and you don't take as much damage. Lee was never really able to accomplish that part of it. He did inflict damage on the enemy. He did defeat them, but generally he lost a lot of men in doing it. Um, but I mean, you have to admit in, uh, you know, from May through into September, his campaign was remarkably successful. Sure. Tom? Not, su not surprisingly, I agree with Scott. Uh, I do think that Lee's sense is that uh, if he is moving into the North, it's going to pull Union armies out of the South uh, and inflict a morale blow and political blow on the Northern support for the war. Uh, there are some secondary, tertiary thoughts that go along with that. Uh, Keep in mind that September is harvest season and that by moving north, Lee is not only going to allow his army to sustain themselves on northern crops, but by pulling Union armies out of Virginia, he is allowing that harvest to be stored to feed his army through the winter and into the spring. Uh, we tend to take food for granted these days, but feeding an army the size of Lee's was a huge burden on Virginia. And he is thinking that the longer he can sustain his troops in Northern Territory eating their food, uh, the better off he will be through the rest of the winter and into the spring and summer of 63. Uh, now these are, as I say, secondary tertiary points to the ones that Scott made that Lee's trying to win the war. And he thinks that this is the best opportunity he has had since the war began to do that. And I think this is why he pushes this army almost to the brink of uh, disintegration uh, in trying to ac accomplish this goal that, that Scott has described. Yeah, and it's also interesting the uh, comparing and contrasting the Maryland campaign and the Gettysburg campaign, because in the Gettysburg campaign, the Confederates, and, and also in the 1864 campaign, when the Confederates come back into Maryland, the gloves are off. I mean, they're just seizing supplies when they're coming into Maryland. In 1862, they were, um, you know, the, conf the, the Confederate forces were strictly disciplined as to how they could get their food, where they could get their food from. It was very difficult, they found, to purchase food because that's what they anticipated doing. They were going to purchase uh, food from uh, Maryland communities and Maryland farmers. And then the Marylanders didn't want their money because they thought it was worthless. And they weren't uh, too enthralled with the Confederates being in their state to begin with. And that's what caused such a problem for Lee, because if he's telling the state, we don't want to be a burden on you. You can't let your men forage for supplies or seize supplies when they enter Boonesboro or Sharpsburg or wherever, because then that's going to turn the people against you, which you don't want to have happen because you're trying to win the people over to your cause. So Lee was kind of caught in a conundrum and um, he doesn't really make the same mistake the next time. In uh, Kent Masterson's Brown's book about Lee's retreat from Gettysburg, I thought he did a fantastic job of documenting, you know, the just the in, unbelievable un, amount of supplies Lee's army seizes not just in Pennsylvania, but also in Maryland. Yes, I, I agree that, uh, you know, again, one of, I think, the most misunderstood points of this campaign is that people take that proclamation that Lee issued in Frederick about 
uh, Marylanders rising up and overthrowing the Union government and joining the South. I don't think Lee believed that was likely to happen at all. I think that is window dressing on a situation. Uh, if you look at strictly a tactic, you know, we talked about the strategic issue, but tactically at the end of the second Manassas campaign, Lee sitting in Northern Virginia with an army of roughly 75,000 men and field artillery. And the Union Army is in Washington, D.C. with 130,000 men, fortifications and siege guns. Now, at any time, any commander, and I'm boiling this down to simplicity, has three options. He can attack the enemy. He can stay put where he is and let the enemy come to him and defend, or he can move. Now, does attacking Washington, D.C. make any sense for Robert E. Lee? Absolutely not. He could stay where he is and defend. After all, uh, you know, they had built the Confederates had built all those wonderful earthworks at Centerville the previous winter and spring. But two problems. Number one, the railroad is blocked and he can't bring up siege guns to put into those works. And secondly, the Potomac River allows those works to be flanked very easily. So my point is Lee can't attack and he can't defend. And so now he's down to move. Well, move where? South, back to Richmond? That makes absolutely no sense. You could go eastward, but once you get below Washington, D.C. on the Potomac River, it's too wide to be crossed with temporary bridging. So you're essentially putting yourself out on a branch and giving the Union Army a saw. You could go westward into the Shenandoah Valley. You can sustain your army there, but you're not carrying out the goals that Lee has set for what he wants to do. You're not gonna scare the Union Army or the Lincoln government by occupying the Shenandoah Valley. And so what's left? Move north. He has no other viable tactical option. So he comes into Maryland as a liberator. Whether the people want to be liberated or not is their problem, not his. And so, you know, he issues that proclamation, but literally the night before he issues it, he writes a letter to Davis saying that he does not expect Maryland to rise up and support his army. I think he's being very realistic about the situation. Well, and also, you know, speaking of that, um, the, the idea of liberating Maryland, which I think is actually kind of laughable. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, Lee tells the Marylanders in that proclamation, we will respect and honor your wishes. And they made very clear what their wishes were. Their, their wishes were clear. They wanted the, the rebels to leave their state. <laughs> so not only does Lee not leave the state, he uses one of their communities as a battleground. He makes the choice to force a battle at Sharpsburg and brings all this misery upon the community in Washington County, Maryland. Um, and I, I think sometimes we, we, when we study these battles and campaigns, we forget about that aspect of it. And some of the uh, things we've seen in Ukraine, some of our operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, if you study those things, you realize that some of these things are universal. And when choices are made by military commanders, there's a price that's paid by, you know, just the same as, you know, when Lee makes the choice to defend Fredericksburg, he has to make that choice, I think. He has to make that choice but the consequences for the people there. I think Lee, you know, strategically is probably right in making the choice to fight at Sharpsburg, but you also at the same time can't just give him a free pass and say, well, that's just the way war is. But when he's issued a proclamation and said, we will respect your choice, whatever it might be, you know, <laughs> and clearly when, when that choice meets, you know, strategic, uh, needs, strategic needs are going to win. Yeah, yeah, let me ask, let me ask a question. Um, uh, the um, Grady McWinney and uh, Perry Jamison came out with a, uh, a book a number of years ago, Attack and Die. And of course, one of the great uh, debates of the Civil War has always been, what was the appropriate strategy? And, and clearly, uh, Robert E. Lee was a very aggressive um, 
uh, willing and, and uh, appreciating the necessity to engage in uh, hard combat. I think, Scott, you made the comment about uh, winning really deep victories, uh, things that, that cause deep damage on the enemy. And of course, the opposite of that is, is Joe Johnson's Fabian strategy that is, has often been debated. In looking at the campaign and, and looking at uh, Robert E. Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, after four or five months of, um, of uh, repelling uh, the offensive offerings of the uh, Union Army, was Robert E. Lee's uh, combat philosophy uh, going to be an effective philosophy, or was it a, in your view, was it just a roll the dice and uh, and try to win quickly because in the long term perhaps he couldn't uh, win in the long term with this kind of strategy? Which what's your view of of uh, Lee and his and his uh, military management tactics and his willingness to fight? I think he was uh, carefully calculating. I mean. One of the uh, other myths that was kind of uh, fostered by the killer angels is that Lee made decisions from emotion. And I don't believe that for a minute. I think Lee was very clinical. He could be as cold hearted as, as he needed to be. And um, I think his strategic thinking and his offensive mindedness was actually the right strategy for the Confederacy I, with, a, with a little caveat there. Um, after the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg, Lee had almost nothing to gain by continuing the battle there. The Union Army occupied a very strong position, and his strategic Lee, Lee lost sight of his strategy, which was to have the initiative, put the pressure on the enemy. And if he had withdrawn back in the Maryland, shortened his supply lines, he would have still had the army north of the Potomac. He would have still had the pressure on the enemy. He would have avoided making Pickett's charge. But Lee, that was kind of Lee's Achilles heel, is he always, he sometimes would overreach because he just had such confidence in himself and in his army. But, um, you know, I think let's take a look at Joe Johnson's strategy. How did that work in the Peninsula Campaign? McClellan got up to the gates of Richmond. How did Lee's strategy work? He drove McClellan away from the gates of Richmond and ultimately forced the withdrawal of the Army of the Potomac from the Peninsula. How did his strategy work against John Pope? He drove John Pope from the field into the fortifications of Washington and created a political crisis. I think that, yes, he's losing a lot of men in these battles. Uh, and I think part of the reason he's losing a lot of men is that the Union soldiers fight well. I mean, their commanders aren't incompetent nincompoops. You know, they're, sure. they're, they're uh, making some good decisions. They're fighting well. They're well-trained. And consequently, the Confederates lose a lot of men in these victories. But I think it sustains that Lee, um, his strategic thinking works. He goes into Maryland, I think, with eyes wide open, my army is not equipped for an invasion. We don't have any logistics, none. Our logistics are going to be, you know, hopefully the Marylanders will sell us food, you know. And, um, but I think he feels the moment, these moments are so rare in warfare. I have to take this risk. I can't do what uh, Jomini might say is the prudent thing to do, which is to, you know, resupply my army, rebuild my army, reorganize my army, because the enemy's doing the same thing and they're getting more men because they just called up 300,000 volunteers. So I think he, I think Lee's, um, I mean, he certainly makes his share of mistakes, uh, but his strategic thinking is, is sound. Yeah, I think after the war, Lee, Lee says to, uh, and I've forgotten which one it was. Scott probably remembers, but he says, I went into Maryland to, to fight a battle. Yeah. I mean, he was very clear about that. The interesting thing to me is he wanted to go to Hagerstown. He based that strategy around going to Hagerstown because Hagerstown, like Gettysburg, is a crossroads town. And if you can control the town, you can move your army in any direction 
And anybody who tries to prevent you has got to pretty much surround the town. And so they are dispersing while you're concentrating. And so I think Lee wanted that battle. He didn't want it at Sharpsburg. That gets forced on him because of South Mountain, a greatly overlooked part of the campaign, in my humble opinion. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, when he saw that a battle might still gain him what he wanted, he didn't hesitate. Yeah. Interest, interesting point, because uh, I was going to ask, uh, was, was uh, Antietam inevitable and was it necessary, in your opinion? Well, my interpretation, and this may differ from Scott, uh, I don't think Lee intended to fight at Sharpsburg. He occupied that ridge for a day and a half and didn't bother to build any entrenchments or fortifications whatsoever. My interpretation is that he was stopping at Sharpsburg because he got word from Jackson that Harper's Ferry was going to surrender and he ordered Jackson to march immediately to Sharpsburg. And from Sharpsburg was a relatively new straight turnpike that went right to Hagerstown. And if the Union Army under McClellan went to Boonesboro and turned westward and followed Lee's army to the Antietam Creek, Lee could turn to his left and march to Sharpsburg, from Sharpsburg to Hagerstown, about 11 miles while the Union Army would have to back up three miles to Boonesboro and then travel 10 miles to get to Hagerstown. So I think Lee intended to put up a bluff knowing that the Union Army would hesitate to attack across the stream with so few opportunities to actually get at his army. Lee could concentrate his army when Jackson arrived, move to his left to Hagerstown and continue the campaign. And in my interpretation, it's only because of Hooker blocking that turnpike on the night of the 16th, probably inadvertently. I find no evidence that McClellan intended that, but I think nevertheless, it forces Lee to stay and fight a battle that he hadn't planned to fight. It'd be, Scott, before you respond, let me just uh, redirect to Tom. Uh, wasn't that part of the element? I know that there was a uh, discussion in which um, uh, after the battle, uh, Jackson wanted to move back towards uh, uh, Hagerstown, didn't he? Back along the river, and, and he wanted to, to push that forward. And instead of moving back, he wished to, to move it uh, uh, up the Hagerstown Pike and, and perhaps around the Federals. Is that well, true? Uh I think what we're talking about is that move that Lee makes in the afternoon of the 17th with a column of cavalry, some artillery, and an infantry regiment or two, and what exactly the purpose of that was and the overall intention gets, I think, a lot of different uh, interpretations from a lot of different people. Uh, whether that was a move to actually try to turn the Union right flank and destroy the Union right flank, or whether it was a move to see if they could get around the Union right flank and regain the turnpike and go to Hagerstown. Nobody has ever, I mean, Lee never said what he intended. And so it's left to interpretation. Jackson's interpretation may have been offensive with the whole idea of can you destroy the Union right with 50 cannons from this position, etc. But I don't think that that necessarily represents Lee's idea. Yeah, and I okay. think the problem with uh, that whole narrative is you are relying on two incredibly unreliable sources. Uh, John, <laughs> John G. Walker's account of the Battle of Antietam, which is extremely unreliable. Uh, just read through the account again. One of my favorite parts of it is when Stonewall Jackson mount, swings himself up in the saddle. He says, we'll drive, we'll drive McClellan into the Potomac. Think about that for a few minutes. Yeah. They're going to drive them across the Atlantic Ocean, across Europe, Asia, across the Pacific. Eventually, they'll get to the Potomac. You can't, you can't drive yeah. them all into the Potomac. I, that, that movement, um, I don't find any evidence that a single Confederate commander favored remaining at Sharpsburg on September the 18th. The only one who did 
was Lee. And the reason that Lee chose to remain at Sharpsburg on the 18th wasn't because he was audacious, is because he had thousands of wounded. He had a single Ford in which to evacuate his wounded who were ambulatory or could be transported. And that was going to take him all day because the wounded, again, I think people forget this. I mean, they're scattered all over the place at these different field hospitals. You have to identify where the wounded are, what their condition are. You have to assemble a transportation. You have to have a transportation plan. Then you have to transport them and get them to hospitals that you're gonna set up down in Virginia and Shepherdstown and Winchester and elsewhere. And Lee's troops have been not sleeping, fighting. Uh, they fought on the 14th, they fought on the 17th, some of them fought on the 16th. His men are exhausted, they needed some rest. So I think, and he gives orders to his subordinate commanders for the 18th. You know, you can respond to skirmish fire, but don't open fire. Nobody was to initiate any sort of an action. He did not want to fight another battle on the 18th. He simply wanted to be left alone so that he could evacuate his wounded and, um, and get his army ready and develop the plan on how they were going to withdraw out of the Sharpsburg position. Um, going back to your first question, you know, was Antietam inevitable? Yeah. Uh, I would say, no, it wasn't inevitable. I think that um, there was a number of circumstances that caused the battle to take place at Sharpsburg. Um, I, you know, Tom and I differ a little bit on this one in that I think that Lee doesn't entrench at Sharpsburg because until Jackson arrived, Lee wasn't sure he was going to stay at Sharpsburg. Mm -hmm. So when he withdraws to Sharpsburg on the 15th, that was simply a temporary expedient to draw the main body of the Army of the Potomac away from McClaws. Then when he realizes Harper's Ferry is going to surrender, then he's like, oh, well, maybe if McClellan doesn't attack me, I can reassemble my army. He doesn't know McClellan's not going to attack him. He has no idea. He can't read his mind. So he is kind of prepared. He's walking a tightrope. If he comes at me, I'm withdrawing. Once Jackson reaches the field with Walker's division, now he's, and he knows he's going to get McClaws and Anderson early on the morning of the 17th. Now he can fight a battle. So I think uh -huh. that's part of the reason why he ends up um, not entrenching his army at uh, Sharpsburg, because he also doesn't know where McClellan might come at him. I think he, he, he guessed that McClellan was probably going to use the upper bridge because mm -hmm. he wasn't directly defending that. And he had room for maneuver. The middle bridge, Lee's artillery completely covered the approaches. The lower bridge, Lee's army is directly defending that doesn't mean McClellan might not come at all three of those points. So um, it is, however, I mean, this, you know, gives some strength to what Tom is saying is that it is unusual that the Confederates make, construct no artificial defenses. But it's also true that um, until Fredericksburg, neither army really constructed many artificial defenses. Now, McClellan does at Gaines's Mill with Fitz John Porter's Corps. Uh, they do that. But, you know, if you look at uh, Fair Oaks and Glendale, there's Second Manassas. Yeah. They just, it's just not habit yet. Sure. Um, if Go I ahead, Tom. Right off topic for just a moment, Len. One of the yeah. interesting things about that uh, Antietam burial map that has surfaced in the last couple of years is it does show Confederate what he calls breastworks, which I doubt are really breastworks. But I am finding a number of veterans' letters talking about putting up some sort of breastwork type thing in the edge of the West Woods along the turnpike. Now, whether it was done on really? the night before or actually, because again, I mean, these guys on the night of the 17th don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Sure. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if some of those breastworks went up on the night of the 17th. Yeah, they certainly and, were there. Yeah, and also um, along those lines, I remember uh, one of those little things that's in an account, I think it's a, a fellow from the 2nd Wisconsin in Gibbons Brigade, um, mentions that Lieutenant Colonel Allen, who commands the 2nd Wisconsin, when they see uh, 
uh, Starks Louisianans start coming out of the West Woods to make a counterattack against their flank. Yeah. Allen orders them to tear the fencing down in the area and pile the fence rails for cover. So I think you also had some cases, and I've also found instances where Union soldiers mentioned the Confederates built some barricades from the, uh, the fencing along the Hagerstown Pike near the Dunkard Church. Now, when you look at the, the photograph yeah. um, of the Confederate dead on the Dunkard Church Plateau, they, it's possible that some of that was like cordwood that they piled up. But, you know, when bullets are flying, people can build stuff pretty fast. You know, oh, sure. To protect yourself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would think so. Listen, what I'd like to do, guys, uh, because I think this would be instructive, um, uh, because the process being what it was, uh, after Joe's book, uh, of course, then, um, uh, sadly, he didn't get to finish, ever, I think, everything, because I know he wanted to, to do McClellan as well and never got that opportunity to do that. Um, uh Actually, I was going to ask another question, but let me ask this question first. Um, um, do you do you view uh, you know Ethan Rafuse came along afterwards and and did a McClellan book? Um, do, did you all have you both read it? Do you have any any sense as to whether or not Ethan filled that um, that contemporary evaluation of um, of uh, McClellan that? that uh, Joe was planning to do, or did, was McClellan just never, ever addressed uh, in the manner in which Joe thought it was appropriate? Tom, you'd probably have a better direct thought about well, that. You know, we should mention that uh, Ethan was a student of Joe Harsh's. Uh, same right. As I, same as I Yeah, was. thank you for doing that, of course. Yeah, and that was actually Ethan's doctoral dissertation, that book. Okay, uh, didn't know that. Yeah. I think Ethan's book is probably the best biography of, of McClellan that's out there. Uh, it's balanced. He uh, isn't shy about criticizing McClellan, but he also, I think, is very fair about where McClellan actually does some, some good things. Uh, if you know the historiography of McClellan, you know, there's sort of books out there that he is the sword and shield of the union and the greatest thing since slaves bred. Yeah. And on the other hand, that he is a bumbling lying fool who can't do anything right. And I think Ethan struck the balance in the middle that uh, there's some good things about him and there's some things that uh, he did get wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I found uh, Ethan's book to be really good. I mean, I like, I like Steer Sears's biography of McClellan too, but I use both of them quite a bit. I mean, because Ethan um, covered some stuff that Sears didn't cover. And um, I thought Ethan was very balanced. It was really well balanced. I also like the, um, oh gosh, Mitchler. No, I got his name wrong. I wrote a biography of McClellan back in the uh, late 19th century. I can't remember his. his I, no, I'm. Who, who's the other biographer of. Uh... McClellan, uh, uh, Tom. Let me see if I have it here. The, the title of the book is Sword and Shield of the Union or something like that's, that. That's Hassler's book. This one is yeah, Hassler. Hassler. But that's not 19th century. That's later. Yeah, no, this one was, I'll see if I can find it here. Yeah. I, I mean, that's kind of one of the things about this campaign is McClellan is really a polarizing factor. In so sure. many people's Peter, view of the campaign, Peter S. Mitchie, uh, oh, it's Mikey, yeah, General, Peter Mikey, General McClellan, nineteen oh one, and okay. um, it, I thought it was a very good book and analysis by a professional soldier. He was an engineer, Mitchie, um, and he didn't. I don't believe Mitchie served in the Civil War, um, but I, it was one of those things. I, I'm sure you could find it on the Internet Archive. But I found some very insightful things about understanding McClellan, particularly before the Civil War out of Mitchie's book. Okay, thanks. Uh, now let me go ahead and pivot to where I wanted to go, but thanks for, uh, for, for going there with me because it just struck me as we were talking about Joe and remembering Joe uh, that I knew that uh, the thing he had told me was he, he had always wanted uh, to do McClellan. 
and he needed to do this other stuff to set up McClellan. And I didn't know how you all felt about that. Um, oh, he told me about it one that, time, actually, Lynn. I'm sorry? He told me about why he did Lee first. Why is that? He said, everybody has me pegged as a McClellan man, so I'm going to do the Confederate side first and leave them guessing. Uh, <laughs> damn. <laughs> that, was, that was Joe, too, wasn't it? He, he was, Absolutely. He was some kind of character. <laughs> yeah. He really was. was yeah. Greatly missed. Absolutely missed. Um, uh, where I'd like to go now, because I'm going to use this to pivot and, and finish our formal portion of it uh, with you, Scott. And so I'm going to turn a little bit to Tom, and, and I'd like to focus on um, um, uh, the this, this series he did with uh, Ezra Carmen. And, uh, you know, you, you had been deeply involved with, with Antietam. It had been part of your life and soul for, I'm sure, as long as you can remember. Uh, what inspired, first, what inspired you to get into Carmen? And secondly, once you got into him, what were the things that really jumped out at you that, that uh, inspired you to continue doing what you were doing? What was it about Carmen that, um, uh, that, that just really animated you and, and caused you to go, aha, aha, I got it? Well, first, let me say, I just think it is incredible that he could have put that manuscript together in the late 1800s, early 1900s, given the sources that were available and the difficulties that he had. I mean, I spent, yeah. <laughs> I spent nearly as go. long create, you know, editing and annotating that manuscript as he did writing it. And I have computers and digitized sources and everything else. So just the diligence and the work that he put in astounds me and still does. Now, how I got to working on it was not surprisingly going back to Joe Harsh. Uh, I will say as a graduate student, one of the biggest problems, and you, those of you who have graduate degrees probably understand, one of the hardest things to do is get appointments with your advisor because college faculty, particularly universities, are infamous for never being in their offices. That's right. Joe was very predictable. He was a creature of habit and he would work on his school stuff in the morning, go into the college and, uh, you know, teach. And then he would work through the evening, but he would go out to dinner every night around 10 o'clock. And Monday night was Chili's and Tuesday nights was out back and whatever. And so I was taking grad classes, got out of class at 10. I always knew where to find you. You know, so I would go to the restaurant, we would talk. And so one night when he was working on the trilogy that he wrote about uh, Confederate strategy, he was sort of venting to me. He said, there's all these wonderful things in Carmen's manuscript, but he didn't footnote it. So how can you really document that this stuff happened? I mean, Carmen just says so, but, and I kind of trying to impress him as a diligent graduate student said, right. I mean, we need to dissect how Carmen knew what he was writing about. And he crooked his index finger in my nose and said, I think you just named your dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> and so essentially volume one of the Carmen manuscript was my doctoral dissertation, but that's uh -huh. kind of where, you know, and then I, when I got a taste of it, it's like, no, I've got to keep going. You know, uh, this whole thing just is so fascinating and still fascinates me. Uh, what what quickly, in there before was, I turn it over I'm to, sorry, to ahead, Scott, no. let me just say this, that, uh, about a month or two before the pandemic set in, I decided that I'd had enough rest and I needed another project. And so ever since January of 2020, I have been transcribing all of the Carmen and Gould letters that Carmen used to create the manuscript. Uh, oh, no kidding. Yeah, there's a little over 2,500 letters, marked maps, oh. notes, whatever. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Carmen is the Joe Friday. All he wants is the facts. Who did you shoot yeah. at, where and when? Uh, and some of these guys in their letters have some wonderful stories to tell, which never make it into the manuscript because, and I don't mean this pejoratively, Carmen is a government employee writing a government report. Who did you shoot at, where and when? And yeah. so I've 
been spending the last you know, two and a half years now with the letters and uh, finding that equally fascinating. Oh, I would think so. Um, but what once you got in there, of course, um, uh, when you're dealing with things literally one at a time, um, what really, what when you looked at that, what what kept you coming back the next day? What what was it kept you coming back day after day? Oh, I uh, many times would just sit back in my chair and look at the ceiling and say, "Okay, Carmen, where did you find this? How do you know this?" Uh, when you read a particular person's writing, after a while, you are able to detect their voice. You know how he writes. And when I would read something and say, this doesn't sound like Carmen, then I would set off looking at regimental histories, letters, official records, wherever. And, you know, nine times out of 10, I was finally able to find them. But that was kind of the thing was it was like a big putting together the puzzle when you don't really have the picture uh, and just say, OK, this came from somewhere. Where did it come from? What sources were available to him at the time? And. Uh, you know, it came together <laughs> better than I expected. Well, Tom kind How of long Tom, Tom kind of downplays, you know, the work that he put in on this. But if you let the thing sink in that he just said there's about 2,500 letters, he had to look through all those letters to determine oftentimes where Carmen got something that he wrote, because Carmen used those letters extensively to uh, document what had happened during the battle. So, I mean, it, that's a monumental task to go through all of that. Oh, sure. Tom, how long did it take you to, to uh, complete it? Well, let me, let me just say, Len, that I'm not working on this full time, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. I mean, when I was doing this, I was married, I had kids, I had a full time job. Uh, there were a lot of things going on in my life. So I really started on this, uh, Around late 1990s, 1999, maybe 98, somewhere in there. And uh, the first volume came out in 2010 and then 2012 and then the, the final volume in 2017. But as I say, I wasn't working on it full time. And actually, when I was working on that uh out of the blue, I got this phone call from a fellow named Joe Piero. Sure, and I know he, Joe. Yeah. And he said, uh, I hear you're working on the Carmen manuscript. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, how close are you to publishing? And I said, well, not very. And he said, oh, good, because I'm ready to publish my edition in another, another month or two. And I just felt like somebody reached into my stomach and grabbed a handful of my intestines and was twisting <laughs> I think oh, I was, Lord. I mean, it was, it was more emotionally upsetting than getting divorced. But anyway, uh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, it was just, I, I, I realized at that point so how good. visceral it was to me that I wanted to finish this and do it right. And yeah. uh, God bless a mutual friend of all of us, uh, Ted Alexander, came to my yep. rescue, sent one of my chapters to Ted Savas. Savas got in touch and said, I see a whale of difference between what you're doing and what he did. I'll publish it. Keep working. Outstanding. Yeah. Scott, I want to pivot to you. We're, we're uh, running down a little to our time, but we're right about where I wanted to be with all this. Um, uh, as I, And I say this not to unduly flatter. I'm not intending that, but merely to set the stage for my question. As, um, as a uh, strong career historian with a, with a professional reputation as a historian, uh, you are the most current and most comprehensive chronicler and examiner of the 1862 Maryland campaign. Your work through Johns Hopkins with the first volume speaks for itself. It, it's a page turner of, of the first degree, and I have no reason to believe that the uh, concluding volume is gonna be anything less than that. As the guy who sat down as a historian to handle this, uh, approach this, 
I'm interested in what animated you. I don't want to spend too, I don't want you to spend too much time talking about the first volume other than the, as a means to get to what you've just done. But what, what did you pick up in immersing yourself in the campaign that um, uh, perhaps is different than what we've understood before in the past that you're, that you're going to bring to light uh, for the first time in 160 years? Well, we could uh, spend an hour talking about that. So, <laughs> well, least. we will once yeah. the book comes out. Trust yeah, me. Yeah, I'm going to. Uh, I'll, I'll just. Um, I'll, I'll make it as brief as I can. Is that um, a battle is like a puzzle, and it's a really interesting puzzle. And um, you're like a detective. You're sleuthing through all this evidence, some of which is deliberate obfuscation some of which is just plain dishonest. Some of it is very, very honest. Uh, some of it is really cursory and so on. And, and you are trying to recreate to the best of your ability what happened. And one of the things I write in my foreword is uh, to, the, to the new book is that um, we know quite a bit about Antietam and about many battles of the Civil War, about the decisions that the commanding generals make. We know a lot less about these battles, about the experience of the people who fought the battle. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the decisions that they made and why they made decisions the way they did and whether they were good or they were bad. And we've also had a lot of our thinking about these battles shaped by superb writers, people like Douglas Southall Freeman, Clifford Doughty. Sure. And, um, in some cases, their research was pretty thin. And particularly in the case of Doughty, he certainly had a, an agenda. I mean, he was very pro-Confederate in his- his uh, Sure, I'd agree his, with that. His, his presentation. Um, but oftentimes I find that, um, you know, people wanna get their book published. They, um, they're gonna write a, a, a book about the Maryland campaign. So you're gonna write a book about the Maryland campaign. Well, if you're going to write about the Maryland campaign, everybody's going to spend most of their time on Antietam. But even still, when you spend most of your time on Antietam, you've neglected South Mountain Harpers Ferry. But you also can't really do true justice to this experience, this, this battle experience. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to present to the reader the, the totality of the experience. I wanted them to understand the decisions that Lee and McClellan make. I wanted them to understand what it was like for private, you know, Alfred Jones in the 20th Georgia or in the 8th Connecticut in, in the battle. And, and for a resident of Sharpsburg uh, after the battle is over, for a, for a surgeon afterwards. I wanted to tell the whole story um, and not just, not just the military story. I wanted to try and make it as comprehensive as I could. And I wanted to take it to... Um, what I thought was its logical conclusion, which is when McClellan leaves the Army of the Potomac. I mean, that is the end of an epic. And um, it is just a remarkable moment in the story of our country and of that army. Um, the way, you know, McClellan gets a lot of criticism and, and I criticize him in a lot of places and he's deserving of some of the criticism that he gets. But when he leaves that army, the message that he sends to everybody in the army is that you serve this government. You don't, you don't serve me. And the Irish brigade throw their flags down in front of them. They, they, they refuse to serve anymore when he's, when he's riding through the camps of the second Corps, and he stops his horse and he tells the men, pick your flags up. You know, you, his, all, everything he's telling these men is I know you're all upset. I know you think this is unfair, but when the rubber really met the road, McClellan was a patriot to his country. And um, that, that's just that I thought that you had to end the story there because I began the story with McClellan um, in the first chapter of Two Antietam Creek. So it's, it's a fascination that, um, you know, I think we, we've reached a point uh, and, and of course, we've all lived through a wonderful um, period of, of advanced scholarship and advancing scholarship over the years. 
that has, um, uh, I mean, each person from John Hennessy's first work on uh, Return to Bull Run, uh, Kenny Knows' work on um, uh, the Paraville, Battle of Paraville, this Grand Havoc of Battle, uh, to uh, what you're doing, what, uh, what uh, Harry Fonts did uh, with Gettysburg. George R- George Rabel's George Rabel's book on Fredericksburg I think is yeah. fabulous. That is another yes, yeah. great. Yeah, I mean, book. so yeah. and 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 the beauty of all that that I have found, uh, uh, which is also a tribute to the sort of work that our our host Karen uh, Needles does as well, is that uh, digging out these sources, uh, such as we've discussed with with Tom with uh, Carmen. Uh, the Batchelder papers and so forth, um, what the historians have been willing to do in the last 20 to 30 years is very, very impressive. Uh, it's, a, it's a legacy that goes beyond, you know, I, I view the guys like Freeman and uh, uh, Catton and folks like that, I, I view them as, as the, the people who wrote the epics, like uh, Ben-Hur and, and um, you know, Lawrence of Arabia and so forth. But uh, once you got down to making good history and good analysis and, and looking at what was going on, I think that uh, across the board, uh, the work that uh, Scott, you and Tom and, and Kenny and, and, and uh, John and others have done, um, uh, George, is uh, a credit that if we could come back 60 or 70 or 100 years from now, I'll bet your books are still the definitive works. I mean, there will be others that will come forward, but I think that this is kind of that, that natural wrap up of, of what we really owed to these people who fought those battle, battles and on those battlefields. I think we owed that to them to bring this sort of documentation uh, to, to the bookshelves. And uh, well, we all we all we build upon what everybody has done before us. I mean, that's right. I I could maybe criticize Freeman or or Dowdy, but we are building upon what they did. We're building upon what Catton did. We build upon. And it's also it's not an individual effort. It's a group effort. So, you know, when you go to the Antietam or the Gettysburg Library or down to Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania, and you look at all those files that they have down there. Well, there was all these people across the country who deposited their ancestors' letters in that library so that a researcher like Tom Clemens or Scott Hart, we could come look at that. And that's a collective effort that everybody is making things available that weren't available, let's say, to to Bruce Catton in in the 1950s that are available to us today. So I think we always have to be careful about being too critical of these people from the past because they didn't have resources that we have today. Yeah, they they spun us all off. I mean, look yeah. at Gordon Ray and look what Gordon did for the Overland campaign. Look yeah. at what he pivoted off of with what Bill Matter allowed him to use. Right. Uh, look at what Frank O'Reilly did with um, what he was given to do Fredericksburg as well. And, yeah. uh, you know, what what you, you said, which really unites all of us over the generations, uh, we had one of our members on on the tour today, I'm out, as you may be aware, I'm doing the Overland campaign with Gordon this week. And um, our group is, is running out. And one of our guys was doing, a, was doing work on um, one of the uh, heavy artillery units. And uh, in a quiet moment, uh, Gordon was off to the side with him, uh, answering his questions about some stuff that he did. And that, that, selfless collaboration that goes on time and again, knowing what people are doing. Bobby Crick has finally finished Gaines Mill, uh, you know, Mm. arguably what's going to be the most important book uh, done of the, of the seven days period. And, and uh, once it comes forward, that block will be put in the wall as well. But, um, and, and so it's really, it's, it's just really exciting. It's a real honor to, to work with you guys over, over all these years and just see what you're doing and, and admire them and have the chance to read them and do those things. So um, with that, we've kind of run toward the tail end. We've got maybe uh, seven or eight minutes. Uh, I don't know if we've, if we've unmuted. If anybody's 
got a question or anything right now, um, uh, certainly uh, we're willing to take a few questions before we go. Um, uh, if you just maybe uh, raise your hand or um, uh, if you unmute, uh, go ahead and we'll be happy to uh, take it. Okay, I see a question from uh, Rich Keys. Um, uh, Rich, go ahead and ask your question. Rich, are you here? Hello? Hello? Can anybody hear me? Test one, two, three. I can hear you. Okay, who's who's hearing me? Me, Dave Bradley, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, uh, go ahead. The question was from uh, Rich Keys. Rich, uh, can you ask your question? Rich, are you with us? I see you're unmuted. Okay. We're just having to um, type it, type it in chat. Type it in chat, Rich. If you can't, uh, if you can't uh, speak, give me a, give me a chat note. In the meantime, while we're waiting for him to come up, um, uh, tell us a, a little something, if you would, please, about um, about uh, what you all plan to do when we uh, when we get together. I know it's a treat any time the two of you get a chance to work. Uh, and teed them together. Um, how do you guys uh, propose to approach that? Well, I would say we're going to do a lot of walking. Yeah. Uh, you don't really understand a battlefield until you walk it. I mean, that's just the basic to me is uh, riding around the tour road on a car, you get some sense of it, but you really have to get out and walk and stop and look and say, what can I see from here? Where can I be seen from here? Uh, you know, if I was fighting, what would I be shooting at from this position? I think that's really critical. Yeah, the other thing I'd say about it is that um, we're not going to try and do a traditional tour, narrative tour of here's the beginning of the battle and then we go through this and that and that. What we're breaking it down into each of the sections looks at a different commander. And Tom and I will kind of take the, we'll, go back and forth as the who's the lead. So we'll look at like Hooker and Mansfield and Hood and McClaws and different commanders. And we'll, we'll try and look at the battle from their perspective. So rather than trying to give you the narrative of everything that's going on, we've done that before. So we thought this would be a different, different approach to, um, to uh, looking at Antietam. Um, I see the question. My question is that Lee had made the proclamation from Maryland. Did he mistake the fact that Washington County was clearly Union ground while the area around Baltimore might have gone with him? Uh, yeah, he definitely knew that Washington County, he knew that Frederick County, he knew that Carroll County, he knew that all the counties in Western Maryland were Unionists because he, um, he had Bradley Johnson with his army who had been a brigade commander but then was detached during the campaign. But Johnson briefed Lee and Jackson and others and told them, you're going to find very few friends um, from kind of central Maryland on west. It's very unionist. So he he knew that. Um, that's a political document, his proclamation. And he had to apply it to the entire state. So he he was very well aware of, of what the politics of the state were. Yes, uh, Rick, I agree with Scott. Uh, for a fairly small state, Maryland is a very diverse state in a lot of ways. And you're quite right. It's the Eastern Shore and Southern Maryland were prime tobacco growing properties with slaves as a principal part of their labor. They were tied to an international market of selling tobacco. But you go west of Frederick and the area is settled primarily by German immigrants who have smaller farms. They're tied to a regional grain crop economy, not a tobacco and slave economy. And uh, it's a very different kind of mindset. Yes, Lee knew that, as Scott says. Uh, you know, Bradley Johnson's right there to tell him, uh, as, as he remarks to Davis in his letter. Uh, I do not ex expect a general rising of the people on our behalf. But as I said earlier, he has no real choice. He has to be in Maryland. 
And uh, so you come in and you portray yourself as a liberator. Right. Let me ask a, a question um, in, in a sports vernacular, um, in looking at, at uh, all the players uh, in the Battle of Antietam, uh, can, you, uh, can you name uh, two or three most valuable players on each side? Uh, who, who are the two or three people on each side that are, are noteworthy by their, uh, by their uh, performance in the battle, uh, either through uh, extraordinary leadership or individual performance or heroism? Uh, who are the two or three MVPs? Well, I would have to say on the Confederate side, Jubal Early is kind of the energizer bunny of the northern part of the field uh, and handles his brigade uh, very well. Uh, certainly in the center portion of the field, Francis Barlow, I think, stands out. Both of these guys are not big names, not uh, you know, commanding an awful lot of people, but they're performing very well in the uh, roles that they're taking. And I think in an outsized sense in, in many instances. Uh, those two come to mind right away. I'll let Scott chime in. I, I would say the, uh, the general who stood out the most to me in the Army of the Potomac is Hooker. Um, mm -hmm. he, he managed his attack extremely well. He was, the, he was really the architect of the 12th Corps attack that unhinged the entire Confederate line and caused the general retreat from the East Woods and the Cornfield area and really inflicted a terrific defeat upon D.H. Hill's brigades that were up there. Um, the, I'll, I'll say the opposite of the MVP in the Union Army is Edwin Sumner. I think Sumner um, was an incredibly brave man who blundered dramatically in this battle. On the Confederate side, I think Lafayette McClaws stands out to me as the Confederate general who inflicted the most damage on the enemy and sustained the least from the other side. I mean, his counterattack into the West Woods, some of that was luck, but another part of it was not luck in that McClaws, unlike Edwin Sumner, um, communicated with John Bell Hood, with Stonewall Jackson. He got an understanding of the nature of the, of the position of the enemy. He had an understanding of the nature of the terrain and that um, shaped how he deployed his division and how he committed his division. And it, it made the deployment of his division the most efficient it could have possibly been. And uh, it, within that division, uh, the one brigade that to me was remarkable in the way it maneuvered was Barksdale's brigade. Uh, it just was remarkable, the maneuvers that they made. But I agree with Tom, Jubal Early um, did a heck of a job when all the Confederate forces on the north end of the field were in a complete shambles except for Early's brigade. And he kind of held on to the West Woods with his sole brigade and a few stragglers from uh, what had been um, J.R. Jones's division to, um, to hold the West Woods. And it was a pretty remarkable job. Last question, guys. Um, other than... A.P. Hill's arrival on the battlefield at the, at the last moment. What point on the battlefield prior to that, in your view, was, uh, was a decisive point one way or the other? Just one, one spot on the battlefield, one point in time uh, in this battle. Um, Scott, if you'd go first. I'd have to say it was uh, Sedgwick's defeat. Yeah, I was going to say McClaw's counterattack, which is basically the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. that uh, McClaw's arrives at the right place at the right time and uh, handles his division very well. Uh, you know, we've kind of neglected the lower end of the field, and I think David R. Jones doesn't get near as much yeah. credit as he should for yeah. hanging on with 2,500 guys for a long time. Yeah, uh, by sure skillfully maneuvering them and uh, some pretty hard fighting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Israel Richardson at the sunken lane, he did a really good job. Um, of course, then he gets mortally wounded, but um, the, the, the whole McClaw's counterattack Sedgwick's disaster 
it, it has a profound effect upon the outcome of the battle because it is going to uh, prompt McClellan to commit the Sixth Corps, which is, is really his primary mobile reserve that he has because he doesn't want to use the Fifth Corps in that sort of role because he wants to keep them in the center. So once he makes the decision to commit the Sixth Corps, that changes the battle. It's to commit the Sixth Corps to the right flank of the army. Well, guys, um, uh, we, we have hit our time. Uh, I'll give folks, if anybody has a last uh, question, um, uh, we sh uh, now's the time to ask it. Other than that, uh, uh, time always flies when you're having fun and uh, <laughs> you can't have much more fun than sit around and, and talk about what we all uh, are fascinated with and love. And uh, you guys are just the best. And I look forward to... Uh, to uh, the program in September, and I will I will bust my onions and make sure we get the uh, registration up online in the next week to uh, to get this opened up for folks. So, thank you so much, Karen. Thank you, and um, uh, folks, thanks for joining us. <laughs>